Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology podcast featuring our neuropsychologist, Dr. Laura Jansen, Dr. Skip Wren, and neurofeedback legend, Jake Gunkelman. Our goal is to provide information, promote options for better mental health. This is an all-star cast that are more than happy to share their knowledge with you. My name is Pete, and today we have on the show Dr. Patrick Porter, founder and CEO of BrainTap Technologies. We're going to welcome him back after a couple month uh, break from us. Can't wait to hear what he has to say. But before we get to Dr. Porter, we'd like to thank our latest Patreon supporter, Outrageous Baking. That's a company name, huh? Outrageous Baking is dedicated to gluten-free. It's a gluten-free bakery that has been around for 15 years. They specialize Again, in delicious gluten and dairy-free sweetbreads, everyone will love. Skip, they ship across the country. So sign up for their newsletter and receive 15% off the first order. Skip, we're all about gut health, aren't we? We are. And living in Alaska, we're all about shipping across the country. Uh, Hopefully, they include us. (laughs) Well, they're going to send a sample and... uh, I think once you get settled in Florida or Alaska or wherever it is, we'll make sure we send some over your, to your way. My wife's gluten free. She uh, she's been in for you know ten years at least, so we can't wait to try it out. Uh, Pamela, thanks again for joining our Patreon crew and uh, also ours Coso. All right, the links for everything will be in the bottom of the podcast notes, and let's scroll down. Okay, for the new listeners out there, we recently had Dr. Porter on the show, and we were introduced to him by Dr. Heather Sanderson from North County Natural Medicine in Mirama. Did I finally say that right, Mirama? Yeah, I think you're so. getting, getting better, I think. Well, I need a little bit more <laughs> neurofeedback. Uh, they focus on <laughs> dementia. Uh, Dr. Porter has 30 years of experience operating the largest self-help franchise and 26 years of operating a cutting-edge brainwave entertainment technology. He's also the Dean of Brain-Based Medicine at Quantum University. Dr. Porter, thanks for coming on the show again today. It's great to be here, Pete. Thanks for having me. Oh, this is great. Hey, for the new listeners, because we're getting a bunch of new listeners each month, and the last time you were on were a couple months ago. Could you give us your background and tell us about BrainTap? Okay. Well, my background is uh, I have a degree in psychology, but I've been working in the, um, the neuro world with my brain tap technology since 1986, actually, we, we invented a, the very first portable light and sound machine. It's something that assists people in uh, training their brain waves to different frequencies. We work very closely with uh, neurofeedback tech practitioners as a take home part of their practice so that people can be practicing meditation, relaxation at home. Uh, brain tap is a tool that uh, we call it brain fitness because we're training the brain in these different frequencies. So, um, it uses two different technologies. One, you can just use the app and do it with just sound alone because sound therapy has been found to be very effective. But if you want to upgrade the experience, we have a headset which uses light and sound and uh, vibration. So it just up, up uh, levels that experience so that you can uh, take it home and <clears throat> basically get even more out of your uh, neurofeedback sessions. If we had a, a listener question, uh, I know we're going to address everything later on, but one of the questions is about take-home equipment. So I think this is a great, uh, great thing to help help answer. Uh, what are some of the products that the, uh, the clients can take home and what kind of symptoms can uh, they help uh, eliminate? Well, we have, we have stress, stress, anxiety, of course, insomnia. Uh, we have 43 different ones, depending upon what they're coming in for, pain. Um, and the, the technology is very simple to use. If you can put on a headset, turn it on. Uh, pair it up with your with your app it could be bluetooth or with a cable and depending upon what you're training we have over 500 sessions that are supporting neurofeedback so let's say that your neurofeedback practitioner says you need to train to alpha or to theta or whatever the or smr if you're going through dementia we have specific training tracks that they're sent home to do Uh, and of course they they work with or without the headset but the headset makes it work uh a little bit faster in our studies it shows it takes about half the time if you're using the headset to get to the same brainwave states as you would if you're using sound only i had a question if i could jump in and it's yeah, I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you brought that up pete 
Uh, because that was the one, the one, you know, listener question that I thought would be perfect for you, Patrick. And it was this idea of, Hey, how's home, home, um, training or, or, you know, kind of self-guided and, you know, full disclosure here as a practitioner, I, I I'm aware that these, uh, opportunities are available for folks and it, and it solves all kinds of problems, right? Folks can do this stuff at home. They don't have to come in three, four times a week, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the concerns always been, Hey, how do they, you know, how, how are they doing it as we would like them to do it? And, and here's the full disclosure part. That's obviously a control issue, you know, for a therapist guy, you know, Hey, are they doing it? Like I want them to do it thing. Not that they can't learn it um, or, or be supervised to do it. So I guess that's where my question lies is, is there a component where they they, they maintain contact with you or they're in contact somehow. And, and it's a, a, at least initially a guided uh, at yeah. home practice. Yeah, what we do, we, we have, there's two ways that our practitioners do that. One is if it's, if it's going off script, like off of our protocols, because we have protocol list. So the, the, the patient or client just goes right into that list and starts with one and goes through number 10. There's usually 10, in e- 10 training tracks in each one. Uh, think of it like going to the gym and doing the circuit training instead of having a personal trainer. The, when they're working with their practitioner, whoever that is, uh, they're going to be working specific. So we can't really, there's, n- there's not a real practitioner driven program. Basically, we just support whatever the practitioner is doing. Uh, they can also give them a list of sessions that they do. We're working on an option with, uh, with BrainTap and our n- next release where a practitioner can actually submit a playlist to their, just like you would on Spotify or Apple Music, where there's a playlist where that, that patient can do it. And also on the back end, uh, we'll confirm to the practitioner that they have actually listened to it. We do this right now with our research. We have a research packet. So we have some practitioners that use our research packet because it's for stress reduction. We have one already uh, outlined like that. So yeah. we're doing it with uh, that with and also with pain and with uh, anxiety and sleep. So we'll have those four protocols done here very soon for practitioners. Right now, the only one is the stress reduction one that's ready to roll. Okay. So if I heard it right, you're, you're working in or, or, or maybe a therapist, right? Air quotes is, is mm-hmm. using your devices with their client. And so then the communication is, is between them utilizing your devices. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. When we're, what we do is at the, at the university that are at quantum, we, they almost all use some form of neurofeedback, at least the students that I'm working with. And so when they, and this is one where they're natural medicine practitioners. So they go out into practice when they're doing that, we have a protocol for them to help with their personal research. Okay. Great. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Jay, what do you got? Jay, you're muted. There we, go. Uh, there, there we go. I have to unmute myself to, to speak here. Um, uh, home training has come a long ways uh, from uh, early days when basically if you had an amplifier and you loaned it or sold it or rented it or leased it to the client, you were lucky if they stuck the electrodes in the right spot, you know, they could switch uh, you know, things around. You wouldn't have any idea. Um, and, and the reporting back was, uh, you know, not really intact since that time, most of the manufacturers have put in, uh, a, a, a session library. So you can actually track what was done and how the training went during the session. Um, uh, they, they're, they're all now online through zoom or go to meeting or some other, um, screen sharing uh, uh, technique. So you can see whether they stuck the electrode in the right spot. Um, you can see um, uh, kind of their demeanor during the session. Um, you can look at the data. You can track the data across time. We're not flying blind. Uh, it's almost it's almost like having an in-office session. Uh, there are therapists that actually track their sessions by going online and doing Zoom uh, sessions on an ongoing basis. Obviously, that's going to end up being a different level of uh, fee because you're tying up a therapist for that amount of time, not just you know doing the session. But uh, the the the, uh, the ability to have it 
basically be the equivalent of an in-house uh, session. Uh, everything except the uh, skin contact of shaking hands. You know, the, uh, uh, it, it, you, you really do have the ability to run a session in great detail, resetting thresholds, uh, changing uh, uh, filters, uh, the, the whole bit, just like you were doing it in office. So uh, um, things have come a long ways. Uh, the internet has, uh, and, and computer technologies now have allowed us to uh, expand a practice uh, from having to be face-to-face, -face, you know, in the flesh, um, uh, to, to being able to be, you know, at a distance. Uh, Skip in Alaska could monitor a session for somebody in Florida. Um, you know, it's, it, it's entirely possible to have a distributed network of clients as opposed to having to have them all in your hometown or within a certain radius. And it saves a huge amount of logistics for the client. I mean, uh, if it's a 20 minute trip to the office, which nowadays that's a pretty quick one, um, you know, a hundred sessions later, you've, you've got yourself a whole bunch of time that you spent just traveling back and forth. Uh, so uh, doing home training uh, ends up saving time, uh, saving money, uh, saving travel. I mean, it's, um, it, it, it's becoming a common form of practice in part because of necessity. I mean, <laughs> the uh, COVID has um, made a lot of people not do sessions face to face. You can't have an office open in a lot of communities for quite a bit of time. So uh, having a distance uh, technique that you can use has replaced uh, standard uh, practice to a large extent. And, um, and it's lucky that that's happened. I mean, ultimately, you know, we don't need to you know, burn gas driving back and forth across town when you can get the equivalent uh, you know, online. So, Dr. Porter, in the last couple months, uh, what, can you give us an update of what's, what's been uh, going on, what's going on out there? Uh, you know, mental, mental health with athletes have been, you know, has, has been coming to the forefront, a lot more exposure towards men mental health. Uh, what, what have you seen in the last couple months and what do you see what's going to go on in the, in the future, in the next couple of months with mental health? Well, I think a lot of people are realizing that um, hopefully that they're able to get out and socialize when, it, you know, as they do that, as they feel comfortable, because I think connection is really important. You know, if they're not getting that connection, I mean, we're getting it here, but this is digital connection. I mean, you do want to press the flesh, as Jay was saying, every once in a while, you know, hug people, your family, hopefully. Uh, I think that what we're seeing is that people are, are taking mental health a little bit more seriously. We're, see, we're still seeing uh, really pandemic numbers of suicides, things like that, that are just crazy because the people are still not living their life to the fullest. And of course, one of the things that um, we want to help with is the hope that people need to have. Now, of course, the athletics we're seeing, like with the Olympics, we'll see it with the Winter Olympics, that gives people a reprieve from, you know, whatever's going on. We get to see it every four years or whatever. So we get to get a little excited about that. But I think with uh, what we're seeing uh, in sports, I mean, it's kind of a, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, you see a sports stadium filled with 60,000 people with no mask on, and then we see our kids going to school with mask on. So, you know, I don't know what the, uh, we've got to do something about that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what exactly to do. I'm not in a place where I can actually say or dictate, but I think that we need to make sure that people are doing things with their mental health. I mean, of course, doing, getting their brain in order is one step, but they really, we need to keep people moving and breathing and doing the physical activities that are going to change their physiology so they don't get you know, if you're sitting around playing on computer games all day when you're, you should be outside playing as a kid, that's going to really change your mood. I mean, uh, I think I said on the last show, uh, we've done a lot with uh, like EAS sports in the professional sports teams. I mean, they actually have teams that play the same games as the physical athletes. These are computer gamers and their brain actually looks worse than the guys playing the real game. So, I mean, when you think about what's happening digitally to people's brains, uh, and what's going on in what, not just in sports, but in everywhere is that we, I think everyone realizes they do need a uh, brain break sometime during the day, something to do to keep their brain optimized. And of course uh, we, we want to look at 
nutrition and activity levels as well. But I, I think that uh, this is basically putting a big highlight on mental health and every mental health practitioner out there should be, you know, busier than a one hand, one armed uh, paper hanger because so many people are so stressed out. And if we can give them solutions that they can use, I, I love them coming into the office, of course, but maybe they can't come in once or twice or three times a week. They need some kind of something they can do at home because while they're not seeing you as a practitioner, they need to be doing something positive. Uh, whether it's a journaling, having a gratitude journal, those are really good things, you know, doing some way to express themselves to, um, you know, making sure they get the proper sleep they need. Uh, but I think in, in sports in general, and just in, in general, what's happening is we have this open window of really hope. And then now everybody's got their fingers crossed and what's going to happen come fall. <laughs> you know, we're, I mean, we're still, we're on the cusp of it, but hopefully, you know, hopefully this all is behind us or we're, it's winding down and we get back to some kind of normalcy. That you was, mentioned, that was, you mentioned it, sleep. Uh, yeah. uh, go, go ahead, Pete. I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off. I, uh, here, because uh, that, I, I think that's going to be a great headline topic. Can, can you, uh, Dr. Porter, Jay, Skip, can you talk about the kids that are sitting in the basements playing video games all day, even the professional gamers? What's going on with their head that, Dr. Porter, you say that their brains are looking worse than the actual physical athletes doing the sport? I am all yours. Yeah, I can answer it first, I guess, and then they skip yeah, into yeah. the The uh, What we're finding is that the brain of a gamer, if they play a game for more than two hours, uh, their brain literally looks like somebody who's been out drinking alcohol all night. Uh, the, the brain is just, and I'm talking about single shooter games now, games that are filled with fear and stress. The body doesn't register, you know, the limbic brain here gets hijacked. It doesn't know that <laughs> these are games. They think that these things are real. And so all that tension, all that stress. And uh, what we found, uh, and we were talking about uh, people doing these, they're really professional gamers. And uh, which to me was kind of shocking because my son said he wanted to do that when he was a kid. And I told him there's no job like that. So <laughs> now, we, now, now he's 40 years old. He's probably cursing me out because there are games like that now. I mean, you could actually get paid to play computer games. But I think when you put on diapers, I mean, some of these gamers, play 72 hours of Fortnite without getting up. People are changing their diapers. I mean, this is craziness. I mean, I don't think you can do anything that long. Um, so, and they say that if you miss sleep for three consecutive nights, you might as well be, if you're driving, you will have the same impairment as somebody who is a, a 1.5 alcohol. So, I mean, you sleep is so important. Yeah. And gaming disrupts that natural flow of, our physiology because you're experiencing all of this in virtual time, but your body's experiencing it in real time. So that's, that, that's my kind of point of view. And maybe Skip and Jay, if you want to add some things to those. Sure. Let, yeah. let me uh, jump, jump in with some data. Uh, you know me, I love my data. Um, back in 1999, they had the theta beta ratio, which was diagnostically able to differentiate ADD from normal. 95 to 98% accuracy. And this is effect size, which is the ability to separate two groups for one from the other. So you've got a curve of one group and a curve of the other group that don't touch. Uh, you've got a good ability to discriminate. So the effect size here is really quite good, is replicated in 2001. But across time, the effect size has gone to hell in a handbasket. We, we don't have the ability to differentiate ADD from normal anymore. You have the accuracy of a flip of a coin. Save me the bother of the hookup. Give me a coin. I'll give you the odds of being in one group or the other. Let's look at what's happened. This is the original study. This is the clinical group, the mean of the theta beta ratio and the standard deviation around it. This is the normal group. The ranges didn't even touch. So it was a very good effect size. Over time, the mean has gone up in the clinical group, but it's gone up also in the normative group. The normal group now is worse than the clinical group was in 1999. So what's happened? Average adolescent has two hours less sleep per night. 
than they did in 1999. What's happened? Well, digital media. 1999, you didn't have texts and TikTok or whatever everybody's looking at. You know, if I was lucky, the, the flashlight that I would take to bed to read with might last 20 minutes or half an hour before it would dim out. So, you know, I wasn't up all night. Uh, and nowadays um, you go to bed and somebody texts you, it wakes you up. You respond back, it wakes them up. You've got this reverberating circuit of waking people up. If it's a group text, you got a whole bunch of people awake. Uh, and then in the morning, your phone starts to beep when your email starts to, all the spam comes in about 5 a.m. Uh, so, so you get it first thing in the morning. Uh, and that wakes everybody up. So you end up with a compressed night of sleep. The study that you quoted of um, missing a couple of nights sleep entirely and being equivalent to being totally drunk uh, on your performance. Uh, if you have restricted sleep, which means six hours or less, which most, there's a lot of people that say, oh, I, I do just fine on five hours. Well, mm, I'm, I'm afraid you might not be perceiving that accurately. Um, uh, people that have six hours or less sleep per night for a week end up taking a week to recover and they think they're okay after day one, but they're not. The, the detailed evaluations of their behavior and performance suggest that they're impaired for an entire week. So, you know, the, the kids who are too drowsy now uh, to end up looking fully attentive, when, when you're in class with your eyes open, but you're actually in a stage one drowsiness, like a highway hypnosis, um, you, you're not really paying attention to the teacher's um, you know, presentation. You're kind of off in ozone land and your performance at school is going to be terrible. Um, Rusty Turner, uh, 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 Robert Turner, Rus Rusty's uh, nickname, everybody calls him Rusty. Uh, he's a, a brilliant epileptologist, child neurologist. And he and I were remarking a few weeks ago that we haven't seen a kid with a normal ability to stay awake for 10 minutes with their eyes closed. And the vigilance model is a way of looking at the EEG uh, developed in, in Europe primarily uh, 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 since the 1930s, uh, developed much more in the 60s. But uh, the vigilance model looks at your ability to stay wide awake and vigilant uh, for a 10 minute eyes closed study. The first five minutes, you should be wide awake the second five minutes, you might have a little bit of stage one drowsing. We're seeing people fall into stage two sleep, which shouldn't happen at all during a 10 minute brief eye closure. And we're seeing them quite often fall into that stage two before the five minute mark, in which case you would actually qualify for an all night sleep study. If it was an MSLT, a multiple sleep latency test, you would have failed the MSLT screening and they would have had to bring brought you back in for an all night sleep study. Uh, if you fall asleep that fast, there's something they assume there's something wrong with your sleep at night. And it could be just that you're taking your tablet or phone or whatever the media is uh, to bed with you. Um, uh, sleep hygiene is important. You know, uh, when was the last meal? Uh, are you consuming alcohol? Um, are you going to bed at a reasonable hour? Uh, is the room, in fact, dark? Um, it, have you wound yourself down for 90 minutes or so before the hour that you're supposed to be falling asleep? I mean, all of those things end up influencing the quality of your night's sleep. And you need, need to be, basically pay attention to all of that. Skip's got his hand up. He's, he, he's, he's so polite. I, I'm, I'm just crude, you know. So I don't know if it's polite, Jay, but thank you. Um, I, I had a comment in general about what we're discussing, which, man, I think there's a, a lot of threads here we could go. And then I had a question directly for you, Patrick, too. And the, the, the Zoom thing, just to call it something, is obviously something we're, we're all becoming accustomed and, and familiar with. And there's benefits for it, as we've mentioned. It's, it's an incredible convenience. And, and so I'm in. I've been working this way since last 
you know, March, April when we had to, right. And it just, you know, my, my experience in working with folks face to face for 20 something years is there was a little bit of trepidation about it. Like, man, how's this going to work? You know, all, all the therapeutic training of being in the room and, and the things you do to establish rapport, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, wow, what's going to happen to that? And my conclusion, and, and I think the work supports it is, it ain't that bad. You know what I mean? I was thinking, Oh my God, Zoom's going to be terrible. I'm going to miss out on all these cues and things and the stuff that happens when you're in a room with someone, which to some extent you do, but I don't think to the degree that it's impacting the work. I'll, I'll say that negativity ne neg negatively, but I mean, it's not bad. Like I'm still able to do all kinds of really uh, connected work with people in this format. So good, you know, my, my experience, good news. There's also a slew of literature that's accumulating on things that are called, you know, Zoom fatigue, et cetera, that I think is inherent to this modality of doing something that, that's so visually oriented through a computer device, which means, you know, blue lights impact and all that good stuff, not to mention just piling up our screen time, which again, a bunch of literature out there on why that's probably not a good idea as you you know, kind of alluded to Patrick, right? So good and bad for sure. Here we are, um, you know, like a lot of things that come our way, let's, let's use them responsibly and effectively, I think, and maybe this is an entirely different show where there's this piece of, Hey, are we getting sucked into some kind of vortex thing that we're going to, you know, come out on the other end and go, wow, that wasn't so hot because I think the screen time is addictive. And, and I think our brains want us to do it because it feeds all kinds of things. Again, I think here's another show, right? We talk about the neuroanatomical processes of that happening where our consciousness is like, I should really not look at YouTube videos for 30 hours, um, but we're doing it, right? So what's that all about? Anyway, along with what's been going on here in, in the, you know, the state of the world and, and how we're adjusting and adapting to what's going on, uh, uh, a lot of health practitioners are offering things that are decent to do. And again, we've alluded to it here, but, but Jay just talked about sleep and there are certain sleep hygiene practices that are preferred and watching your phone or checking texts, you know, the hour that you're supposed to be chilling out before you go to sleep. Like that's not a good idea. And diet of course is important. Uh, the, things that happen when we socialize and, and maintain a connection to meaningful people in our lives is somewhat immeasurable, right? Meaning it's in its value and importance. So those things are really important to do. The idea of being in touch with your you know, environment, meaning a connection with nature is, is a big deal in what it does to our, our senses as we go out. Um, my wife and I used to kind of chuckle, definitely in a snobby way, about this idea of a forest bath living in Alaska. It's like, what, what are you talking about? It's like, we go forest bath when I go and, uh, you know, take, take the trash out. Right. But it, it, when you live in a city, it's not the same thing. So the idea of maintaining connection with nature does things to us, I think on a level that's probably not always consciously recognized that's invaluable. Right. So these things are all, all really important. And it, that's the comment section. Um, so feel free to edit that down, Pete. But the question, Patrick, and we touched on this a little bit uh, last time we met, and it was towards the end of our, our meeting, but there is this other pretty big component that we can do for self-actualization, self-expansion, self right? And, and you mentioned journaling, but you also talked last time about some work with Joe Dispenza, and, and I know the titles of your books kind of fit, in my mind at least, in Joe Dispenza land of this idea of... Mm -hmm expanding um, our, our potentials and consciousness. And so here's the question, and it's really wide mm -hmm. net, but what kind of science have you guys uh, collected at, at, in regards to this? And I'm going to call it, you know, kind of a focused, maybe scripted meditation. I know that's not maybe mm -hmm. how others would describe it, but I, I want to open the door for you to be able to answer that any way that you want, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we, we have one, um, study going on right now at Valencia College in Florida. And what we're showing is that um, we, we're doing it two ways. One is with music and one is with music with a guided well, mindfulness practice. And we're not using our headsets. So people are wondering, we're just choosing sound. 
So what we did was we had a 45 minute session both times and one just had music. And what we're looking at is if somebody's meditating to music, what happens physiologically to them? And of course, it does exactly what we think it would do. Down regulates sympathetics, up regulates parasympathetics and puts them into a relaxing state and increases alpha for those that are wondering, you know, the brain waves and things like that that are going on, which is just what we thought. At the end of that music session, we wanted to see what did the brain go back to its let's say default mode network, or did it go back to, you know, like, did it go back to its alpha beta, uh, you know, or alpha theta is really what we're looking at in beta. What's the range? Is it going back? What we find is about 45% beta on the waking state and 30% alpha tends to be a pretty good operational state. Uh, I was looking at that research. I'm going to try to find that, Jay. Maybe we can, you can shoot that to me or give it to me that that looks some interesting numbers what we found is that that seemed to be right and then maybe 10 percent theta now that changed right when when as soon as they started we did a live reading so we wanted to see what happened during the time well during the time of listening to music it bounced right back to at the end of it it went right back to the same brain state they had before so there was really no no brain training what we wanted to see was what if we put an algorithm, one of our algorithms in the background of that, that's a, drain, a brain training. Remember, we're talking to the really the limbic brain. We're teaching it to follow the patterns of binaural beats or isochronic tones. Can it do that through frequency follow response? Well, during the, we had a five minute washout. Then we did, then the same person listening to the same music, but this time it was encoded with the sound frequencies. What we found at the end of that time was, Yes, indeed, the brain did change at the end of the 15 minutes. It didn't go back. It actually stayed there at that peak level for over three hours. And it took 72 hours for the brain to regulate back to its, quote, normal default network with nothing in a washout. Now, we did the same thing with words. And what we found with when we're using guided imagery and words is that um, some of the people actually did not respond as well favorably to the words only as the music, their brain didn't kind of deregulate or let go of that beta brain that, that because they were following along with the words, we engaged their left hemisphere is what my thought is on that. And they weren't able to let go because they weren't able to, but then when they listened to it again, which could be just a factor of them knowing the content and now they know what to do, they're not, they're, their uh, left brain isn't quite there. We, we experienced the same kind of thing that once they were done with the lecture, the, the guided imagery expert lecture with, with music in the background, everything, they were able to downregulate. So what we're, what we're trying to prove out, and now this isn't a 150 person study right now, because what we want to find out is, does the brain learn set independently with experiences, or does it actually have to have this algorithm that we've been creating over these years? So far, what we're finding is that if they're just doing an experience, like going to an IMAX, they have a great experience, but it's not brain changing. It's just an experience. So we need to figure out, like if you're doing neurofeedback training, how long does that training last? That's one of the things we want to look at. Does it last for, we, what we find is it lasts about 72 hours because the nervous system wants to bounce back to whatever its default mode network is. So that's where the uh, duration, you know, how many times you're seeing them every week. We find that if you can see them every day, you make a much greater change. The problem is it can become very expensive <laughs> to the end user to come in every day. So uh, in, in our effort is to figure out for our, for our students, really, we're trying to figure out what's the ethical amount of time they need for different protocols. And what we're finding mostly is for at least the first uh, 28 days that we find if they can come in every day, we get a maximum return on that. If not, even after 40 sessions, they're not getting the same event uh, the event horizon, if you will, where the change happens, happens much faster in the 28 days of compressed learning rather than spreading it out over, uh, you know, let's say 10 weeks or, or, or 40 weeks or whatever the, the protocol is. It seems like the, the more you let the brain just kind of regulate itself, it goes back to its normal setting, its default setting. So that's, I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but that's kind of a, the research we're doing in that area. I think the beauty of a wide net question, Patrick, is any answer uh, is, is answers the question. You know what I mean? And, and that's why we uh, like to you know, have guests on and let us hear about what they know about. But you, you brought up the default mode network several times. And 
my way of conceptualizing how how this work works, and, and I'm I am thinking of meditation, but that's such a broad umbrella statement, is that it, it's a conscious uh, attempt at adjusting, altering, changing, however you want to think of it, unconscious neurological functioning. And that's default mode network, right? It's sitting there and it's running on home whenever we're not doing what we're doing and just sitting there, default mode network kicks in. And for many folks, the default mode network is what it is, but it might not be the most healthy functioning or, or most efficient mm -hmm. functioning for one in their environment, right? And you can mm -hmm. get stuck on rumination. You can get stuck on, you know, future focus and which translates into anxiety and depression, things like that. So you answered it for me for sure, but I'll let, I'll let Jay and uh, Pete jump in too if they want. Quick, quick question for everybody, because I'm going to hone in on game. Is it called Gamer's Brain? Do you want to give it a title, guys? That's good. I like that. I've yeah. never heard it. Right. Maybe you just coined a new term. So <laughs> All right, there we go. You heard it here first in Neuronoodle in Aspen, Colorado. Okay, so you got kids that are in the basement playing video games, smoking weed, Okay, what whatever the drug of choice is, how like what's a, the executive functioning of their brain? Like what's going on, guys? Can you? Because I represent the parents out there. They're like something's up with my kid. Can you explain how gaming mixed with you know drug of choice uh, damages the, the brain and wonder why Johnny isn't uh, functioning so well the next day? Sleep. You talked about that, but could you? Uh, Give us a synopsis of how this all comes together that really screws these kids up going forward in the future. I just, right, before, before these guys go, and, I, and, I, and I'm more interested in hearing them than me, uh, gaming is a drug of choice too. And, and I think the, the brain actually does respond to the stimuli as it would others. Individual drugs of choice obviously have different effects. But anyway, gaming is a drug of choice in, in my understanding. So there we go. Yeah, the brain is getting definitely getting some neuro activity there, and they're getting they're getting a dopamine. They're dopamine addicts, is what they are. They they want to get that dopamine hit, and that's not really good for the brain because it's going to suppress um, the other functions. Because this is part of the reactionary, the limbic brain is taking over, and it's not trying to kill them. You know, a lot of people think this high flight or flight, like their body's turned against them. It's basically when you're playing the game, it it thinks that. I mean, remember, it doesn't know the difference between real or imagined. So it's it's actually thinking that tomorrow you're going to do this again. You're, we're going to have to face all these things again. So it's setting up that anticipatory stress. Then if you put on top of that any mind-altering substance, I'm not going to say it doesn't have to be weed. It could be any mind-altering substance. The brain's going to start to wire around that new change with that the state-dependent memory. So now they're... They're basically, I mean, we have cannabinoid receptors, we have uh, psilocybin receptors, we have, when we, when we produce GABA, we're producing DMT. So, I mean, our body already produces all these hallucinogens anyway, <laughs> you know, to, to your point, Skip, that it's the drug of choice. It's, it's actually activating these different neurochemicals. The problem is then our brain gets hijacked and we're not creating them anymore. It's, it's creating for us be, because we're getting all that stimulus. So the brain is basically reacting. And when the brain learns to react, it doesn't know how to interact. It can't, it's like it can't do both at the same time. Very few people can, I should say. You know, you can't just, like if you had an argument, let's say with somebody, you, most people can't just take a deep breath, walk away and be super, you know, Mother Teresa the next moment. You know, there, there's gonna be some residual uh, of that energy or that emotion. So I think that the, the main thing is that when they get that high agitation, they're, there's a lot of things going on. The stress from one stressful event is equivalent to a sugar, a candy bar. So the liver produces sugar. So when these kids are sitting there and they're doing their sugars of choice, their body, our body produces almost all the sugar we need if we're eating nutritionally. So when we're, when you're stressed out, you're, you're overproducing sugar. It's going to lead to diabetes. And, um, and of course, sugar is mood swings and things like that. So most people don't think of the sugar. I, I've, I've met so many clients over the years that say, I don't understand why I got diabetes. I, I don't eat sugar. And I go, do you get stressed? <laughs> you know, so, and of course they do. That's what's causing their diabetes is their stress, not the foods. Because our bodies are designed to give us that hit of energy to fight or flight. So, so Jay, I, if you want to add something there. Yeah, cortisol, um, your stress yeah. hormone 
forces glycogen release from the liver. So it is, you know, glycogen is uh, a, a stored form of glucose, uh, which you, you end up burning. So uh, that is problematic. You know, uh, uh, Skip mentioned the default mode network. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of work on various brain networks nowadays that have been identified in the fMRI machine. Um, I'd like to show you the default mode network in an fMRI machine. Uh, you get a big flare at the posterior cingulate, a little flare at the anterior cingulate, and the two temporal parietal junctions. What this really is, is time smeared for a couple of seconds. And what there's actually going on is that there's four small networks that are flip-flopping between them rapidly. This, these are microstates. They're held for about 82 milliseconds, and they're not. They're, they're rapidly flip-flopping between each of these microstates. And when you add them together and smear time, you get the default mode network. The, the, it's resting state network or default mode network, like the brain is doing nothing. Well, actually the brain is twiddling its thumbs. There's this rapid flip-flopping between states. And this is what's get happening actively during the brain doing nothing. So um, we, we really do need to use microstate analysis of, the, of any network that's been identified on an fMRI to see what the dynamics within the network are and whether you can model it as a static network or not. If you were to create a model based on EEG, assuming that you had to have the alpha in all of these spots at the same time, first of all, there's also beta going on in these networks, but um, you, you basically wouldn't see it that it, it, it'd be one piece or another piece or another piece or another piece, but not all, all four of these spots happening at the same time. So uh, uh, the dynamics is missing from the fMRI data. Uh, we do need to go back in with microstate analysis. Now, why doesn't this paper, why isn't it well known? It starts out with math. I mean, the, <laughs> the entire paper, the first half of this paper is all math. And who wants, I mean, when was the last time you dug into a math paper? Uh, this is written by Ro Roberto Pascal Marquis, the author of Loretta, and then his boss, Dietrich Lehman, who's passed, and uh, a, a large group uh, in both the University of Zurich uh, as well as in Japan uh, that are working with default mode. And this is from 2014, but it's, it's really kind of an unknown uh, paper, again, probably because of the math. Um, but uh, it, it's, I think, critical for us to think in terms of the, how fast the EEG is and how slow fMRI is. Uh, we, we have a, a, a brain imaging based on EEG uh, that's much more dynamic, uh, much more active uh, than w if we look at it with fMRI. Hey, Jay, just because we kind of lost our connection there for a second, can you do a quick recap on the default mode network, where it is in, in, in the brain? Sure. Uh, uh, pop back in, into, the, into the document here, flip down. Um, so the uh, default mode network basically has four microstates uh, that make it up. These are the four microstates, uh, posterior cingulate left, posterior cingulate right, posterior to anterior, and then posterior singlet all by itself. And those four states last each about 82 milliseconds plus minus four. And you, again, you flip flop between these. Uh, it's, it's, it's like playing the song on the piano with your knuckles. You know, well, these are your four notes. Um, and uh, you, you play these four notes in a, in a pattern repeating itself. And what you see is essentially posterior cingulate to the left, uh, temporal parietal junction, posterior to the right. These are bidirectional and they have alpha and beta in them. This is posterior cingulate to the anterior cingulate, again, bidirectional, excuse me. This one is unidirectional from the back to the front only. And this is the posterior cingulate sitting there all by itself, but it's all lit up. Uh, so when you add those four states together, you get the microstate uh, analysis of the default mode network which was identified in uh, the fMRI. 
basically with somebody at rest with no task. This is, this is your brain when it's not doing anything, supposedly. Well, in fact, it's, it is doing something. It's rapidly flip-flopping between these four subsets of this network. And uh, the, the dynamics are lost within the fMRI smearing the time. That's all. Okay, thanks. Sorry, guys. How did, uh, wh 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 where did it get chopped off, Skip? Uh, I asked um, Jay. We, we passed the baton to Jay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think we covered back over anything. Yeah, I think we did. It. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, good. So, yeah, sorry about that. That's one right. one of the nice things about being on the road. You're, that's all right. It's all true. <laughs> no, I think gamer brain. I think that's going to be a huge uh, topic. Uh, uh, Dr. Porter, anything else we can do to help plug your uh, your business, your products? Well, I think just have them go. If they want to learn more about it, they can go to braintap.info. They can download my book, Thrive and Overdrive, for free. They get to keep that whether they do anything with BrainTap. We do have a premium model, so there's no cost if you want to continue to listen to BrainTap. But there are, of course, paid options, too, for people that want to do that. They'll get a free option on the app, and they'll get the book. And then they can see if this is something they want to add to their uh, their therapy protocols, see if, see if they want to uh, use it or not. It's it's an optional thing. I mean, then, uh if they if they let us know that they're from NeuroNoodle, they just have to text in. I will open up the professional side of the of the uh, app because if, when Whoa. the uh, everyday user doesn't use it, they don't get the professional side. So I'll open up that so they can see all the different brain trainings and things that aren't available to the general user. Pete, uh, isn't yes. it, isn't it really important for people to watch the NeuroNoodle Network podcast? They get free <laughs> access to professional level software. I mean. Uh, uh, how, how much better does it get than that? Plus, you get to hear Jay Gunkelman say Neur "neuro noodle." <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Porter, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Let Let's do this again, man. Go on the calendar, pick ninety days out of whatever, and you know we got gamer brain from you. I mean, that's huge. We that's great. Well, thank you, thank you both. This is great. I love uh, having our chat. So let's see uh, what we can do for the next one. Thanks, we, we love nerd, nerding out with you, doctor. Take care. <laughs> okay. Thank you both. Okay, thank you all three. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, Jay, Skip, we have uh, Sandy, who's been so kind to us, faithful listener. She, 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 she has some questions we'd like to answer for her. If we could just cover that, then uh, I'll do the end of the show. Sure. Um, uh, she, she basically uh, ended up indicating that she was being recommended to do some evaluation of her metabolism and diet and uh, uh, that sort of evaluation because she was having trouble progressing within her neurofeedback. And uh, there, there are individuals that end up having uh, toxic or metabolic issues, and that was her concern. Uh, what 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 we could we do to help guide her towards um, uh, evaluating whether she even needed to look at toxic metabolic stuff or not? So, um, it, you know, it, it, it's important if you're uh, uh, running into um, a, a spot where you're not progressing that you actually evaluate what's going on. And there are times that what's going on is something uh, toxic. You, you can have mold spore and that's messing things up for you. You can have uh, yeah, uh, uh, other toxic or metabolic disturbances and they can be mistaken for psychiatric or psychological issues. Uh, we evaluated um, a kid for a, a client in Texas and it was an adopted kid and he was acting out pretty badly uh, he was, I think, 10, 11 years old. And, um, you know, they did the EEG. And we read it as somebody who had a toxic or metabolic encephalopathy. And the therapist called and said, well, what, what do we train? And I said, well, no, it's not what you train. Your next step is to evaluate what kind of toxic or metabolic problem your client might have. Well, uh, this young man was an adopted kid. 
and adoptees sometimes have reactive attachment. And that was their running theory that his bad behavior was basically a, an attachment issue. And it, that's a perfectly valid you know, uh, uh, possibility. In this case, however, it wasn't. He was adopted from Russia. And what they didn't know is that he was adopted from the area adjacent to Chernobyl. And he had no thyroid function. Uh, we, we recommended testing. Uh, and they, they said, well, what kind of testing? I said, well, look for toxic or metabolic issues. Well, metabolic is to a large extent thyroid. And um, radioactivity destroys your thyroid fairly quickly. And so he was sputtering along, not really functioning well. And if you don't have a brain that's working well, you're not going to behave normally. So um, once they put uh, supplementation, uh, you know, pharmaceutical supplementation to his thyroid function, um, he, he popped back to being a, a 10, 11 year old kid, not, not a little hellion, uh, but a, a, a normal kid that interacted in normal ways. So um, you do need to watch out for things. Now, you can also have some genetic anomalies that give you uh, uh, what looks like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia type presentations um, uh, that, that actually have uh, genetic anomalies with respect to metabolism. Uh, uh, MTHFR uh, um, uh, uh, is, is a, a gene and it changes uh, metabolism. And if you, if you've, and, and there's a lot of different uh, uh, genetic variants within that gene anomaly. Um, so it, it's not all identical. Uh, some of it is just messing up male sperm count and things, but um, there are also uh, things that mess up metabolism and your B vitamin metabolism ends up being one of the things. If you have a difficulty with methylation, uh, you're going to have metabolic disturbances. Um, now the client uh, mentioned that methylphenidate helped and that she was dependent upon sugar and caffeine for her energy. That's a pretty solid piece of evidence that there's something going on uh, with your metabolism. If you're dependent upon sugar and caffeine and, and methylphenidate to have energy. So it's time to have a good internist or endocrinologist to look things over and make sure that there isn't some sort of uh, foundational uh, toxic or metabolic disturbance. Um, uh, the fact that she was um, a, a, a vegan, basically, uh, also may have uh, some influence on it. You, you do need uh, uh, appropriate levels of protein uh, with a, a proper uh, mix. Uh, you also need um, uh, essential fatty acids. And there are people that are uh, uh, into uh, a vegan diet that end up with uh, not enough oils um, uh, in their diet. So uh, th those, those are all important things. And if your therapist is noticing that you're not progressing in a normal way, and they recommend that you, you know, look at toxic or metabolic possibilities, that may be holding you back, uh, it's, it's time to follow their advice. Um, uh, go to your internist, have some uh, blood work and your analysis done for just the routine things. And, and then also the possibility uh, that uh, um, you, you may end up having uh, uh, something that's a little bit more esoteric. But uh, uh, we, we, we do want people to end up with a, a positive uh, experience with a neurofeedback learning curve. You don't want to spend your time and energy and come out the other end of a training uh, series without progress. So if, if partway through your therapist points you towards a further evaluation because you're not progressing, uh, it's time to cut your, uh, cut your loss at that point and, and point yourself towards further evaluation uh, that may point to what's, what's going on that may be holding you back. Uh, once you fire up the metabolism um, and uh, have a, a fully proper uh, diet and everything, you may end up finding um, things working a lot better and 
uh, your progress will suddenly kick back in. Uh, Dr. Skip, can you quickly before you go, disclaimer time, we're not giving medical advice. Right. Right. All we're saying is, hey, look, Skip's the doc, me and Jay. Jay's like the legend in neurofeedback. I, I don't have any degrees in this. You know, it's, I don't have any licenses in, in this, right? So, so check out with your therapist, your doctor, and whatnot. Okay, we're going we're gonna to give you clues to bring up with, with whoever's treating you or training you. Is that right, Dr. Skip? Can you word that in a better way? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let the listeners decide that, right? But oh, yeah. I, 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 to echo what Jay's saying, and Jay spoke, I think, really well, specifically and generally too, but specifically to this listener's questions. But in general, the way I, I, I just kind of think of all this is if, if neurofeedback is a intervention to allow us to, to do other things better, right? Like I've always thought um, of, hey, let's get neurofeedback going. You'll be a better candidate for therapeutic interventions, whatever they might be. Backing up one, one layer or you know 10,000 foot, whatever approach view of this, then something like functional medicine, which again, Jay alluded to in different, different ways, would allow us to address issues that might be contributing to how our brain is then functioning, then therefore reacting to neurofeedback, right? So we've had Heather Sanderson on, we just mentioned her again in today's show, but they look at overall physiological functioning of your being, right? Hey, how's everything working in conjunction with itself? Um, how, how is uh, your endocrine system working? How's the limbic system work? They, they consider factors that impact your functioning beyond the, you know, relatively, I don't want to say limited, but, but focus that traditional Western medicine might have if you go to a specialist. For example, Heather's going to look at and talk to you about what are your sleep habits, <clears throat> excuse me. And then there's a whole list of things we can do to address that. It's going to look at what is your diet and not just, hey, are you eating Doritos, right? going to do all kinds of panels, more tests than you'd ever thought were possible on blood work, urine analysis, fecal analysis to see where your body is state and trait wise, right? They're going to do things that are going to allow for some kind of assessment of, are you being exposed to toxins? Hey, is, is there mold in your urine beyond levels that should be? Well, what the heck's that about? Let's determine if that's the case, because yes, that would influence how you're reacting and things that could be misdiagnosed as a psychological disorder the symptoms are there right hey i'm i'm having trouble yeah. concentrating or i'm you know hearing things or something that's psychological stuff but where the heck's it coming from and if you're sitting in a mold factory you know right um uh, meaning your house is infested or as jay mentioned with the kid that lived next to chernobyl up here uh we have kodiak alaska which was a navy base uh coast guard base that you know also has been used as a hazardous waste site storage air quotes facility what the heck's that doing to the folk that live that live on this island not to mention the fish around it that we eat but hey sorry for going there everybody but th those types of things all i'm saying is a focus or or a at least consideration of the impact of these you know surrounding uh situations needs to happen too so th that's how I'd summarize it, Pete. Only took me five minutes to get there, but that that that's the idea. Like, the hey, let's power of ten, editing. Yeah, right. Ten thousand foot view. Of, it's also why psychiatry. Why it takes us so long to answer a question, Pete. Right? We got to get it all in there. <laughs> but if you're doing this ten thousand look, you know, of, of the situation, you, you obviously get to see more in this analogy. But you're considering things that are impacting what is right in front of you. And I think that's the approach. It just takes longer, right? There, there's more to consider. So there we go. No, outstanding guys. Another great show. Gamer brain. I think that is going to be a keeper. There we go. Um, you know, Mary Swingle, Paul Swingle's daughter does work on a video game addiction. And she'd right? probably be a good person to bring on at some point. Okay. I'm I'm on that, Jay. Uh okay, here, let's let's knock this out. Because we got a new sponsor here. 
Okay, guys, we thank you all for listening to the Neuro Noodle, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology podcast. Again, we'd like to thank our Patreon supporters. Outrageous Baking, new supporter. Welcome aboard, Pamela. We love you. We hate glutens, but we love you. And Ars Coso, old school Ars Coso, been with us for a while. Skip, we really are all about gut health, aren't we? Absolutely, Pete. You know it. <laughs> all right. And that's outrageousbaking.com. Check them out. We're, I'm going to get some product. My wife's gluten free. She's going to try it. And when she gives me the thumbs up, I'm going to say yes. I'll eat anything. I don't care. But my wife's pretty, pretty picky. <laughs> all the links will be in the podcast notes below. Contact information, everything for Dr. Porter. You'll see it all there. Hey, you got an idea for a topic? We love our listeners, as you, as you saw from the show. Just email Pete at neuronoodle.com or leave us a voicemail in the podcast notes. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Smash that like button on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. And again, hey, if you really, really like us, like Outrageous Baking and Ars Coso, you can buy us a coffee on Patreon. Ain't that right, Jay? Yeah, they got a lot of good airtime for a very, very small price. So A fraction, a fraction. Well, we thank you for listening. Cue the music. Healthy gut. Healthy